reason is this commercial. You know, every time you're watching TV, and so we want this on the video also, so every time you're watching TV, you run into commercials, but normally I take my little thing and I fast forward through yes. the commercials. Yes. I like that. But I will not fast forward through this commercial, and so uh, we would like to have Holly, would you tell us this good news? Okay. Aw. Um, this morning on my way to Bible study, I received a phone call from Jeannie Birdie, who is with Picture House, and they are, it's unprecedented, but they are going to re-release our movie Fatima, Amen. and they're going to re-release it in 350 theaters, AMC, and it's going to be released on May 7th, Mother's Day, through May 13th, the feast day of um, Our Lady of Fatima. And it's just such a blessing because, as, as I mentioned, once you release a movie and it's been streamed, that, that's all she wrote. But AMC really believes in, in the project and in the message. And so I would like to encourage all of you for Mother's Day, find an AMC showing Fatima, the movie. Take your mothers, take your daughters, take your friends. Um, and so it's going to be re-released, and that's the greatest blessing. Oh, So if you'd like to open your Bibles, we are on chapter 16 of Exodus, and um, the uh, first eight verses, and so let's just go over those verses together. This is a short lesson because we're doing half lessons each each week, and um, so we're going to get into this just a little deeper, maybe. So this is Exodus chapter 16. From Elam they set out again, and the whole community of the sons of Israel reached the wilderness of Sin. Now that was a thorny area and a lot of clay in the in the sand there, and that was between Elam and Sinai on the 15th day of the second month after they had left Egypt. Now God has a reason for telling us how many days, when is the feast day coming, and everything like that. And the whole community of the sons of Israel began to complain against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness and said to them, Why did we not die at Yahweh's hand in the land of Egypt when we were able to sit down to pans of meat and could eat bread to our heart's content? As it is, you have brought us to this wilderness to starve this whole company to death. Then Yahweh said to Moses, Now I will rain down bread for you from the heavens. Each day the people are to go out and gather the day's portion. I propose to test them in this way to see whether they will follow my law or not. On the sixth day when they prepare what they have brought in, this will be twice as much as the daily gathering. Moses and Aaron said to the whole community of the sons of Israel, In the evening you shall learn that it was Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of Yahweh, for he has heard your complaints against him. It is not against us you complain, for what are we? Moses said, In the evening Yahweh will give you meat to eat, in the morning bread to your heart's content. For Yahweh has heard the complaints you made against him. Your complaining is not against us, for what are we? But your complaining is against Yahweh. And so um, this is what's happening. We have a, a people grumbling, that's for sure. And so when God answers the complaints to his people, and he answers these complaints, they complain. Can you imagine after that miraculous event with a release from bondage, God parted the Red Sea, they walked through it on dry land, and yet they're complaining. And so they complained, first of all, after three days, they were complaining because they were thirsty. And so first of all, God provided the water, as we learned last lesson. God provided water at Merah, but it was bitter, and they couldn't drink it. But God showed Moses um, the wood. He pointed that out to Moses and told Moses to throw that wood into the water. And it sweetened the water. It's just like the wood of the cross sweetens our lives because God does the work for us. And it is sweet. And I think that's why they call it when we, Father Maloney, or Monsignor Maloney used to say, 
Oh, happy fault on Good Friday. It was a terrible thing, yet it was the blessed thing for us. And so that Good Friday, we were very blessed to know that Jesus, our Lord, died on the cross for us. But then God led them to Elam, where there were 12 springs of sweet water and 70 palm trees. And I just wanted to let you know, um, the uh, 12 springs represent the 12 tribes of Israel. And the 70 palm trees represent the count of people of Israel when they entered Egypt. There were 70 there. And so God is going to promise. Now we're going to look at some things this week and next week. God promises to take care of his people. And he promises food to them. He promises water. And then we will see next week how God provides. Because God always does what he says he will do. And God's promises are true. So our last lesson we talked about the wonderful song of Moses as he led the, Israels, the Israelites in praise of God and his might against the evil army of Pharaoh, and he helped them, um, and he led them out of that land of slavery. Israel had crossed the Red Sea, and from our previous lesson, we know that God had commanded the Israel, Israelites to take along with them a month's provision of food in their exodus out of the land of Egypt. And now the 15th day of the month has come. It's been a month. All the food was used up. So one month later, the Israelites have watched their food supply dwindle. So the praise given to God has not turned into perseverance and trust in the Lord. For some reason, the God whose power and might has been shown to them, their praise turned into fear because they saw they were running out of food. And that fear manifested into a pathetic grumbling against Moses and Aaron. Now the people think they're complaining to Moses. They don't say to Moses, in verse 3, you have brought us to this wilderness to starve us to death. Yet, back in uh, the previous chapter of Exodus, we read that the people said, God brought us out of Egypt. But now they're complaining to Moses and Aaron. And we know God led them by a pillar of cloud in the day and a pillar of fire by night so they could visibly see God was leading them. Yet, they're blaming Moses. Do you ever get nervous when you see your own food supply dwindling. Don't you think that was interesting um, in the pandemic and how last year there was a rush. The, the shelves of food were just completely gone practically. You couldn't even buy things that you needed or wanted, especially toilet paper. <laughs> you wonder. Okay, so, but we rarely have that situation now here in this country or we're not aware of it because we don't sometimes pay attention to what's going on in the other countries where there's a famine and, and disease. Because it doesn't exist in our own lives. Many of you have, at one time or another in your lives, had problems financially or illness or some crises, and if you wondered, how are you going to pay your bills? How are you going to eat, too? I do have a short little story about how whenever I was single uh, and I was working, I, I would take $5.00 out of my paycheck and buy myself bread, milk, and bologna. <laughs> so that was my food really for a long time because I didn't have that much money, so but I would buy that because I thought the milk would be healthy and I never even liked milk. But I did it because I thought it was good for me. But sometimes we do have these problems financially and we're wondering how we're going to pay our bills, how are we going to eat also. Uh, have there been those times which you wanted to turn away and wonder, God, are you going to provide for me? Times when you complain to God, and, and we need to keep trusting, but you ask yourselves, just how in the world did Jesus supply those loaves for 5,000 people? We don't know. And sometimes you want God to supply and multiply loaves for you. The Israelites had gotten to a point where they had no food left, now you think that after all God had done for them, they would wait and see what God and how he was going to feed them and take care of them. You would, wouldn't you? I would, wouldn't I? Or would I be like those Israelites and complain? How many of us have seen God's mighty hand in our lives and we turn around twice and forget that God has taken care of us? I say to myself, the Israelites just don't deserve God's continuing, continuing help. As I look at them from this time and place, I can say that. I wasn't there. But I do know this, that um, 
God does continue with his goodness for all of us at all times. I mean, wouldn't they obviously know that God is going to take care of them? He has for me. Hasn't he done it time and time again for you too? And then I remember myself saying, oh yeah, time and time again, God has blessed me. God has helped me. Just let me get into a little problem though. And there I go. Much like the Israelites, I start complaining. I really want to be like Moses, who turns to God for everything and trusts God for everything. Though more often than not, I'm more like the Israelites as a whole. I remember that story in the Bible where um, Jesus had to go around Samaria, to, uh, Samaria and they got into this town and the people didn't want them there. And so the, the apostles, the disciples said to Jesus, let's rain fire down on them. <laughs> That's like me. Let's rain fire down on these people who aren't appreciative. So how can we trust, yet God will provide? God will provide. How can we keep from being afraid? Because our fear turns into complaining, for sure, against God. I'd like to suggest a way by sharing a personal situation I had this week. We were in the ER, emergency room, at Palomar because Kenny was short of breath and having a hard time breathing. So here we had to trust again and not be afraid. I asked the Lord, how we were waiting there almost five hours, and I was saying, how can I not be afraid? How can I embrace this situation? That's hard. And I began to pray and to praise God. Lord, this is what you've done for Kenny in the past, and I believe you can do it again. Please help us. And God had given me this scripture the previous week, Psalm 56, 3. Raise me up, O Lord. When I am most afraid. And he does. That's what he will do for us. Psalm 56, 3. Raise me up, O God, when I am most afraid. O my God, I do trust in you. And as I prayed there in the emergency room with Kenny, I felt as if the Lord wanted me to embrace, embrace this time of passion, because that's what Jesus did. Embrace the cross with all your heart and get your eyes fixed on Jesus until I stopped being fearful. I didn't want to be a complainer, but I have to admit, I may have complained a bit. Are they ever going to call him back to take care of him? And, um, but Jesus, once I fixed my eyes on Jesus, everything changed. The power of God came into me and strengthened me because basically I was a mess before I could get my eyes back on Jesus. So what we have to do in times of stress like that or crises, we need to remember what has God done for us in the past. We remember our, our Ebenezer's. And then we begin to praise God and we keep our focus on Jesus, not on the problem. Because the scripture says, seek ye first the kingdom of God. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. So we seek God first. And in Jeremiah 33, 3, it says, Call upon me in your day of trouble, and I will answer you and show you great and mighty things which you do not know. And the great and mighty things that God showed us was Kenny became okay. He didn't have shortness of breath, and, and we didn't have to spend the night in the hospital again. So that was such a blessing. But fear has a short memory sometimes, doesn't it? And we begin to murmur and complain, and our memory really gets clogged up. Like the Israelites, they couldn't even remember what God had done 30 days before, not to mention the pillar of cloud which led them. They filled their minds with the wrong thing. St. Paul says this to the Philippians in 4, 4 through 9. Do not worry, the Lord is near. But if you need anything, ask for it with praise and thanksgiving, and he will give you peace that passes all understanding, and he will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Um, actually, that Philippians 4, 4 through 9 is the first uh, scripture that I ever memorized, except for delight thyself in the Lord, he'll give you the desires of your heart. I always liked that one. That was easy to remember. But this is the first scripture. When Kenny had colon cancer in 1980, I ran across that scripture, and it was saying, don't be anxious, do not fear, be anxious for nothing, do not worry, the Lord says. Of course, that's where we go first of all, we worry. How can I uh, fix this situation to think that we can do it? But I didn't have a computer then, so I hand wrote the scripture out, this Philippians 4, 4 through 9, and I put it on my refrigerator, I put it on my kitchen table, I put it in my 
an office room, and I wrote out one for my car so that I could continually remember the Word of God. He tells me not to worry because He is near, and He tells me that He will be with me, and He will give me peace that passes all understanding, and He will guard my heart and my mind in Christ Jesus. Because when we're in a crisis, we, need, we have all of these things that say, oh my gosh, what's going to happen now? And so we begin to build up fear rather than faith in Jesus. And so finally, um, Paul says, fill your minds with everything that is true. Who's the truth? Everything that is noble. Who's the most wonderful and noble one we know? Everything that is good and pure. And that's Jesus. Everything we love and honor and everything that can be thought virtuous and worthy of praise. That means fix your eyes on Jesus. Look at him when you're in times of trouble. That doesn't include grumbling and complaining. Only fear brings that about. In my notes, I um, have taught this lesson so many years ago in 1999. And in my notes, I read that Janine Healy's mom and Rose's mom, her name is Tony, she would say, I'm not complaining, I'm just explaining. <laughs> so what comes out of the house in time of distress? We need to explain it to somebody. We need to tell them our problems and almost us in a sense because we tell Jesus our problems too. And especially if it's a sister in Christ, we're talking to the Lord. We're talking to the Lord about and explaining what's going on in our lives. Now the scripture verse also that God gave me this week was Philippians 4.11. Yes, Paul tells us, I've learned to be content in whatever circumstances I am. And the Lord just spoke to me this morning and said, remember, tell everyone, for such a time as this, God has put you in this place, in this world, for such a time as this. Because God has a plan and a purpose for you, and he wants you to live it out. Even in this pandemic, you are a witness to God. In one, in one of the hospitals, it's the last one that Kenny had, um, the, they were doing some whatever a procedure on Kenny and it was very painful so I knew that the little nurse I had already witnessed to her and I knew she was Catholic and where she went to church and all that stuff and when she went you know gotta find out those things so if you want to witness to someone so I did uh, witness to her and so I knew she was a Catholic and believer and a strong one and so uh, I stood right next to her when she was doing this procedure on Kenny because he uh, he wasn't doing so well so I just I prayed out loud extended my hands towards him and put my hand on her shoulder to help her do the work she needed to do and I just began to pray in tongues and um, afterwards she said do you think you, uh, she said I wish I could take you to every room with me <laughs> to give peace to the people so anyway I thought that was a witness to the Lord so God has a purpose for us and so we need to be content in whatever circumstance we're in Paul relied on God for everything therefore he was content and contentment means God satisfies our hungry hearts. We are hungry for God. God will satisfy our hunger for Him. He will satisfy our hunger for food. He will satisfy our hunger for peace. He will satisfy our hunger for healing. God will feed His people, and that's us. His presence to us is so good, and His promises are so good. He will do what He says He's going to do. Now, the Israelites didn't have Paul's words of exhortation, yet you and I think they would have remembered how God brought them out of Egypt, right? Have you noticed it's hard to complain and to praise at the same time? <laughs> you have to let go of the complaining so you can start praising God. And that's one of the ways to battle a crisis that you're in. You battle with praise. Um, I can remember falling down steps one time, and I think I've shared this with you before, but the thing is I began to, when I was there after falling down the steps, I said, Lord Jesus, I love you, I thank you, I praise you, because I know you're going to help me right now. And um, so that is one way to battle. No matter what the battle is, begin to praise God and praise his name out loud, especially if you're in a spiritual battle and you're going through something that's scary, that's a spiritual realm. Just begin to praise God because Satan hates the praises to God, and He will dis He will um, dispel all that darkness. God will, and send Satan to flee. That's why we pray that um, Saint Michael prayer: uh, defend us in our battle. So God is so great and so merciful. When we heard their when He heard the complaints of the Israelites, did He rain down fire on them like the apostles wanted Jesus to do on that town? It seems like that's what they deserved. But that's my humanist speaking. God is a God of love. 
He is a God of mercy. As we know, this last Divine Mercy Sunday, we celebrated God's divine mercy upon us. His mercies are new every morning. He doesn't uh, rain fire down on them to punish them. He speaks to Moses and said, Moses, I'm going to rain down bread for you from the heavens. This will be a test for them to see if they will follow my law. So he doesn't rain down punishment. He rains down bread from heaven. And the Israelites complained that they had plenty of meat in Egypt and could eat bread to their heart's content. Well, their memory was a bit warped, wasn't it? How soon they forget their misery. They were in pain and suffering and in, under slavery and being beaten and hurt and, and having to do terrible things. It made me think of a woman in labor, the pain and suffering soon forgotten for sure because the child brings joy. Or we remember the good old days. People always remember the good old days as if they were so great. But I do remember this. When I was a teenager in high school, the gas only cost 20 cent, 25 cents a gallon. And on occasion, it was on sale for 19 cents. But I can remember my little Chevy putting in one gallon of gas because that's all the money I had <laughs> after I spent most of my allowance on myself. But anyway, so those were the good old days. Hamburgers were 25 cents and Cokes cost a nickel. Remember that one? Maybe you're not old enough to remember the nickel Coke. Remember the nickel candy bar? Yep. Now look at it. Wow. Of course, what we aren't remembering is that the size of the paycheck was also a lot different. Now, my father-in-law always kept talking about how cars, they're not just like, they're not like they used to be. They used to be made well. Uh, but I think he had forgotten what a hard time it was in the snow and cold morning to heat up that car and to crank it and to make it go because of the cold. So yes, our memories distort the reality of what was. Just as the Israelites had forgotten the ugliness of slavery and exaggerated what they had, and now they were afraid. And because they were afraid, they began to complain. When God plagued the Egyptians, it was to make them know that he was the Lord God. And now, when God provided for the Israelites, it was to make them know he was their God. This is a really interesting thing. I think if you think about Abraham, his name was Abram. God called him to follow him and promised to descendants beyond his imagining. But yet he had no, no children and it was already his old age. But God gave him a new name, Abraham from Abram. And then... God had that relationship as the firstborn Isaac. He had that relationship where Isaac loved God so much and trusted him so much that he knew God was going to provide. He didn't know how God was provide, but he laid his son on that altar ready to sacrifice his very own son. Yet he didn't know the mystery that God had a plan for, but God provided a ram and he didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. And then, of course, there was Jacob. And Jacob encountered God at, at Peniel. And God... He wrestled with God. He wanted to know, who are you, God? I, I want to know you. And he wanted the, that birthright. And so God gave Jacob a new name, Israel, and his sons are the 12 tribes of Israel. And now God is showing the Israelite nation that the Lord is God. He, is, he brought them out of that slavery, and they were slaves, but now their new name is Israel. He established a nation when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. And so now... Uh, God promises to rain down bread from heaven. And God also says he will test the people to see if they will follow his law or not. And so he gives instructions to the people through Moses. Moses and Aaron said to the whole community, In the evening you shall learn that it was Yahweh who brought you out of the land of Egypt. And in the morning you shall see the glory of Yahweh, for he has heard your complaints against him. And Moses goes on to say, you are not complaining against us, but you're complaining against God. No. Can you imagine? Oh, we thought we were complaining against Moses. We're complaining against God. Oh, he might strike us with fire. They said, God promised me in the evening and he will rain down bread for heaven. Isn't that just like a merciful father? When we realize our sin, does he rage at us? No. He embraces us. He goes to the cross for us. And he forgives our sins. He died for the forgiveness of our sins. But God raised him up with the resurrection power of his love. God protects us. He takes care of us. He guides us. Like the story of the prodigal son, all the complaints the younger son had. And so he left home only to come back. But when he came back, he came back to a feast.
prepared in his honor, not to a discipline that shamed him. And that's what God does for us. There have been times when I have said to people, and like even in, in hospitals, that's where um, I, I'm real busy in the emergency room praying that he'll marry for this person and some very for this person. It's a busy place, that emergency room. But to testify to people when they share with you, oh, I haven't been to church in a long time. Yes, I, I grew up Catholic. And I say, come back. You're welcome back. God loves you so much. And so that should be our witness, a witness of love, a witness of welcoming. Come back. God does not want to shame anyone, or he doesn't want us to judge anyone if they haven't been to Mass for a long time. I do know this, that there are times when our retreat would come each year. Monsignor Fred Flores would say, this is so exciting. That person had, to be, had not been to confession for 25 years. This person came back into the church. This person is renewed. I mean, we used to see all kinds of wonderful things happen at our retreat time because God is a merciful God. And God, in his mercy, rained food, not fire from heaven. He still does that for us today, and he still feeds his people. So sometimes it's hard to trust God when we're in the midst of a trial or a crisis, and out of fear we might complain. But we ask the Lord, raise me up when I am most afraid and he will do it. God does what he promises. He will do it, and we will see it in our lesson next week, how God provided for the Israelites. So thank you, Jesus. Lord, we thank you for this word today, because you are a God who promises so many things to us, and we believe you in your word, for your word is alive, and it is active in our lives. And so thank you for every word you give us in the power of your love. We ask, Lord, that you would allow this word to nestle deep in our hearts, Lord, that we can trust you even more. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen.